Can you please all stand if you're ready? The Lord be with you. Amen. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Amen. Glory to you, O Lord. After this, the Lord appointed seventy others and sent them on ahead in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the labourers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out labourers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide. For the labourer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And I speak in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. <coughs> On once when I was at Theological College, did a placement, as we all had to do. And, well, I did several placements. And one year my placement was in a prison. Bullingdon Prison. It's north of Oxford. It's a category B prison, so there are some pretty hardened criminals in there. They've been set in concrete. And <laughs> thank you, they don't get any better. If you don't listen carefully, I'll tell some more. And um, it was a very interesting experience. Never been in a prison before. Well, I have been in a prison before. While it was being built, because in my, during my teaching career I supervised some year 11 pupils on their, or was it year 10, on their work placement in one chapter was attached to a building company who were building a prison up on Teesside. And the very first thing they built was the surrounding wall so that all the building equipment didn't continually get nicked. And but that was my only time in a prison, a half-built one. This was different. This was a very, very salutary experience. To be honest with you, I hated it. I was attached to the prison chaplain. Did you know that a, le a prison can't legally be opened without a chaplain? It's one of those interesting facts. But he had to carry, as everyone did, a bunch of keys with him wherever he went. He couldn't go anywhere without unlocking and then locking doors as he went through them. Every single door. Every single gate. I felt claustrophobic. We spent some time with one of the prisoners in his cell with the door shut. I felt, well, I wanted to get out as soon as I could. Some of the prisoners we saw were on the hospital wing. Some were on suicide watch. They were in cells with a glass door with somebody continually looking at them and after them. And I thought to myself, you know what, we talk blithely about sending people to prison. Prison is an awful place. And you value the company of others more than anything else. Visits are incredibly special. The feeling of isolation, shut in a cell, quite terrible. Now why do I talk about that? Well, it's because Paul's writing, as we hear it in the second letter of Timothy, is written from a prison. And he talks about people. It's towards the end of the lesson, the letter. And he says, you know what, my time's nearly over. But then he talks about people. And the people who were special to him. 
and the people who have done him harm and betrayed him. And he said, only Luke is with me. Luke had stayed loyal. We read in the Acts of the Apostles how various people deserted Paul and had fallings out with him. He was obviously a very charismatic but uh, quite volatile person. But Luke had stayed loyal. The beloved physician is what Paul calls him. He had been trustworthy and true. He had been there when Paul needed him. In prison. Visiting. <coughs> helping. And that is what comes across in Luke's writings. It's an interesting fact that about a quarter, over a quarter in fact, of the New Testament is made up of Luke's writing. He was a great writer, a great storyteller. He wrote, obviously, the gospel that bears his name, but also the Acts of the Apostles, from which we heard as our first reading. And he was involved with Paul then. The point of our first reading is that it starts off describing the travels of Paul with the pronoun they, and then halfway through it changes to we. Have a look back at your reading sheet. Paul was obviously, sorry, Luke was obviously with them, traveling, sharing in the mission. He was a physician. He was probably uh, a Gentile, not a Jew, probably Greek. We don't know quite where he comes from, perhaps Antioch, perhaps uh, Philippi. There are various traditions around. But he wrote his stories in such a way as we can identify perhaps with them, his stories, more than any other in the Gospel. For example, the Good Samaritan. It's in Luke's Gospel alone. As is the story of the prodigal son. The words of Christ in the Passion to the women of Jerusalem and to the good thief. Today you will be with me in paradise. It's in Luke. He has an emphasis on poverty, on prayer and purity of heart. He features women more prominently than any of the other Gospels. He's an accurate observer and many of the things he writes have been confirmed by archaeology. So he brings things to life and he's loved by everyone. So, not surprising he's made the same thing, is it? And people have been inspired by his writing and by his example. Now, the Gospel is about the sending out of the 70, although in some verses of the Bible you read 72. Manuscripts are about split evenly between them. Why is Luke sending or has G why does Luke have Jesus sent out 70 or 72? A chapter after he's had him sent out the 12 apostles. Well, it's because the symbolism is of the 12 going to the 12 nations, tribes of Israel, and then the 70 going to the whole world. The tradition in the Old Testament, in Genesis 10, for example, the nations of the earth are numbered. And in the Hebrew text, there are 70 of them. And in the Greek translation, the Septuagint, there are 72. It's symbolic of Christ sending missions to the whole world. And that's what Luke's writings in themselves mirror. He writes the Gospel for the nation of Israel. And he writes the Acts of the Apostles. For the nations. Jesus is ministering to Jews in his gospel. In his Acts of the Apostles, he's ministering to the whole world. So Luke's outward attitude is fantastic. What Luke believes, and above all, he shows in his writings, is that God's love is for all humanity. Embracing the last, the least, the lost. It's embodied belief. Christ's people, 
Christ's spirit, Christ's body going to everybody. And so as an evangelist, he's wonderful. And people recognised what he was about. They recognised his heart and he was loved. But let's come back to our Gospel. The Gospel reads Jesus, or has in it, read Jesus' instructions. Whatever house you enter, say first peace to this house, and if suddenly there is a son of peace, as the text has it, your peace will rest. <clears throat> Remain in the same house. Do not move from house to house. Whenever you enter a town, its people welcome you. Eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there. It's interesting, isn't it, how we punctuate sentences. There is no punctuation in the original Greek. You have to put it in as you think. I think it reads better if, you, if Jesus is saying, whenever you enter a town, they receive you. Eat what is set before you. Full stop. Heal the sick and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. So close to Luke's heart. Heal the sick. The Greek word there is therapeutum. Therapeuo. From which we get therapeutics. Therapy. And it primarily signifies to serve as a therapon, an attendant. Then to care for the sick. To treat, cure, heal. We imagine the 72 being given supernatural powers. We imagine them being sent out and Jesus telling them to do what he did, to lay hands on sick people and they get better, but there's probably much more than that. Some people are gifted with the gift of healing. Some people can pray for people and they get better. Most of us care for people. We do the best we can for them. Some of us are privileged to have been trained in medicine. We stand in awe of their knowledge. But even they will say, well, there are some things we can treat and there are some things we cannot. But healing is much more than just physical wellness. It's being alongside somebody. Paul was, in effect, healed by Luke, by his loyalty. It was therapeutic. Luke was with him. And that is the best thing we can do for anyone, is to be alongside them. And our Gospel says, Jesus says, if you do that, you bring the kingdom of God with you. Heal the sick and say to people, the kingdom of God has come near. Because being alongside somebody, being therapeutic, brings God's love, embodies God's love into places where it is most needed. And that's our job as a church right now, during this pandemic. We're physically separated from people, we struggle to understand the various complicated rules by which we're supposed to socialise or not socialise or go to the pub or don't go to the pub or uh, whatever. But if we're there for people, the Kingdom of God comes through us and reaches into people's hearts. Perhaps we need to be more open about the way that works. Perhaps we need to say more about Christ being in and among his people. But as we go forth, as we go into the rest of this day, into the rest of the week, into the rest of the year, we resolve once again to be loving agents of God and take Luke as an example of someone who was always there. To the glory of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit.
Amen.